we're going to jump into the message. And I was thinking about that this week. Uh, here, here's something funny for me. Um, this week, <laughs> I'm not really a wine guy, so uh, this week, one of the local funeral homes, uh, who we have a good relationship with and we do a lot of funerals with, uh, they brought in for Clergy Appreciation Month, they brought us a bottle of wine. And so, like, maybe this is kind of a frequent flyer program. Like, you do a lot of funerals with us. Uh, here you go. I have to tell you, I've been uh, serving Jesus in the Valley as a pastor for 20 years. Never has this happened before. And here's what went through my twisted mind. Uh, when they came in, they, I saw it was a red wine. And thank you for that. When I was thinking red wine, I hope that's not blood. I hope that's not blood. That's what I was thinking. Funeral home, handing out wine. Uh, here, here's what's going on. But I'm going to tell you, uh, it was great in just in this because I was in the middle of preparing for this morning's message. I was getting ready for this morning's message. And I was thinking, Lord, you're going to use this in some way. You're going to bring this in. And this will come to, to play as we open God's Word this morning. But I was thinking about uh, how many... Funerals that I've been a part of, and how many memorial services, and how many graveside services, and here's something that happens at almost every single one of those. And if you have been to one of those lately, you'll it'll be fresh for you. This is the truth. That here's what I uh, I see happen is that usually at some point, whether it's funeral, memorial, or graveside, there will be some words spoken. Uh, about the person who has passed away their life. Have you recognized that that's what happens? And we'll have, often maybe somebody will uh, read something, or uh, there will be something printed, and uh, this will be a part of that memorial time. And I was in the middle of this when the bottle of wine came in the door, and I was thinking about this already. What words would you want to have shared about you. That would be truthful, not embellished, not, not, not uh, oh, they were a wonderful person when they were a scoundrel. Uh, this is, what words would you want said about you? So think about this. What, what are some descriptive words that you would want spoken of you, whether it was at a funeral, graveside, memorial service in that way? And how much, how much more powerful it those words were spoken to you while you were still living. If you were told those things and you were appreciated in that way and you were uh, able to embrace the words, and I want to just give you a few words that are going to lead us right into where we're headed today that I would love to have said of you, said of me, said of us, any follower of Jesus Christ, someone who has put their faith in Jesus, that these words would be descriptive of you, not just when you die. Here's a couple of words. That you and I, that we would be described as teachable. That we would be described as teachable people. Here's another word. That you and I, that we would be described as humble people. People. And not just like, oh, hey, we threw that out there because we think we should. No, it's true of us. That you and I, that we would be described as courageous people. That you and I, that we would be described as sacrificial people. That, that those were words that were said of us. That you and I, that we would be described as wise people. People that would be known as teachable, humble, courageous, sacrificial, wise. I pray that these words would be said of you, would be said of me, would be said of every believer here at Harvest, every believer that knows Jesus in this world, that these words would be describing your life. You say, well, they didn't describe you this past week. Well, I pray that they would describe you this next week. I pray that they would describe you this next week. Because the truth is, you and I, we want that being said of us because it's true of us, because Jesus is changing us. In fact, these words, teachable, humble, courageous, sacrificial, and wise, they are words that describe a difference maker. A difference maker in our world. We're praying that God would use us to be difference makers wherever we go, whatever we do, that we would be difference makers. And I want you to see today as we open God's word together that these words are true of a difference maker. Her name is Esther. 
and we're learning about her life. We're seeing what Jesus will do in her life. In fact, if you have a Bible this morning, would you take it out and let's see this difference maker this morning and let's be together in this. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. We'd love for you to be in God's Word uh, with us. Esther is in the first half of your Bible. It's a historical book found by Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and right there. And I'd also uh, alert you that I checked the app to make sure it was working and uh, found out that yes, uh, you can go there and it says humility versus pride. That's the title of the message today. And you'll see if you scroll down just a little bit, becoming a difference maker. What's on the screen for us today is there so that you can uh, have those notes for you as well. And so as we get into it today, I want us to begin with Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5, we'll read uh, the first half. By the way, today there are only two points to the message. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah. And I should tell you at the same time, there's a whole bunch of sub points. All right. Esther chapter 5, verse 1. Let's look at this together. It says this, Esther 5, verse 1. On the third day, we'll come back to that, it's important. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room, opposite the entrance of the palace. There's a lot of details there. Some of that we'll understand. Some of that uh, we can only kind of imagine because we don't know exactly uh, the place where she stood. And when the king saw Queen Esther, now here it is. This is either life or death for her. When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. That's life right there. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. That is proper protocol. If she doesn't do that, she's dead. If she doesn't follow the protocol, she's dead. She touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? You're here. He knows she's here. Not being summoned. It shall be given to you, even to half of my kingdom. And Esther said, if it please the king. Listen to these wise words. If it please the king, let the king and Haman, the prime minister, come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast and asked that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine, wait, probably from the funeral home, probably there, <laughs> And after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My, my uh, wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And so we, we come to this, and it's a cliffhanger. It's, it's left for us to see that she is not ready to make her request. She's going to bring them back a second time. But what we're going to see in the middle of this account, this historical account, this recorded for us, is the beauty of the hand of God moving. In all the details, in the background, God's beautiful hand, powerful hand, is moving. He's moving Esther, who is now in step with His Spirit. He's moving her. And we can recognize this as we see this unfold. We can see this is God's hand moving. And we are convinced of this, that as we read our Bibles, this is God's work for us. Amen. 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 And so as we get there, they say, well, what does it have to do with my life? I want to remind us that the Bible, as we read it, the Bible is not about you primarily. It's not about me. The Bible is number one, first and foremost, always and forever. The Bible is about who God is. Who God is. Secondly, the Bible is about what He has done. And then third, it's about how we are to live in response to who He is and what He's done. If we read our Bible accurately, we will see today who God is. 
If we read our Bible accurately, we will see what he has done. That is the book of Esther, a historical account of what God did to rescue the Jewish people. How he saved them from certain death, genocide. As we do this, we will see that God has a plan for Esther, and we will then see that God has a plan for you and for me. And so as we do this, uh, let's understand a few things that you can see the beauty of God's hand moving, even in the timing. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. It says this, first, the first words, On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court. As we see that, on the third day, as we study God's word, we see that we need to be teachable. We need to learn. We need to, to grow. We need to say, why is that in, important in any way? Esther said this. She said to Mordecai, her cousin, who raised her as her adopted father, she said, ask all the Jewish people in the entire capital city of Susa to fast with me and to fast for me because in three days we will fast all of us together and on the third day after that I will go to the king even though even though I know that going to the king is against the law I will willingly break the law in fact to have an opportunity to rescue lives I will do it fast and pray with me now here's where we uh, dig in and understand this a little bit she it says here, on the third day, Esther went, not after the third day. And if you're a Westerner, you can get all caught up and stumble over some things where there's a difference between an Eastern mindset regarding calculating time and a Western mindset calculating time. A Western mindset says this, uh, three days, that's three 24-hour time periods. After three 24-hour time periods, that's when Queen Esther would go. That's when she would go before the, uh, the king. That's how we would calculate time. But the Eastern mindset is this. On the third day, all she's saying, fast and pray for me. Any time on the third day, any point in that day, I can go. And that would be technically, I have fasted, I have prayed, I have prepared for three days. On the third day, I go. You say, well, why is that important? It helps us in understanding this. We see that Jonah was in the belly, in the the stomach of the great fish for three days. And we said, well, that must have been three 24-hour time periods, and that must have been, you know, how could he have enough oxygen? How would that all work together? And we are trying to do that in our Western mindset, or this more importantly, how is it that Jesus rose on Sunday if he was put in the grave on Friday? How is that three days? And people stumble over the resurrection. People have rejected the resurrection of Jesus outright because they are trying to apply a Western calculation of time against an Eastern calculation of time, and they just say, it doesn't work out in my mind, therefore it must not be real. They say, that's because you're approaching it in the wrong way. Be teachable and learn. Be teachable and learn. On the third day, during that third day, she has fasted and prayed for the part of the day she has fasted at least a part of the day for three days, and on that third day, she goes to the king. Let's take a moment right there and see something. Three days. Three days. Three days. We see it numerous times in the scripture. What does that mean? Forty days and forty nights. Forty days, forty nights. We see this about our God. What it reveals to us about him, what we see recorded about him and how he does things, is this. That he is a God of order. He has a style. He has a manner. He has a way of conducting himself. And you can see it throughout scripture. You can see that he does things not in chaos. But in a very orderly manner. Not in a cold or stoic pushback way. But in very much in a thoughtful, very intentional way. And as you look at your Bible, as you understand this, you say, my God is not a God of chaos. That's the world I live in. That's a world of chaos. There's so much craziness going on. But my God is a God who enters into that chaos and he brings about an order. You see, there's chaos happening all around Esther right now. There is an edict that says, we want, the king has signed it with a signet ring that's very much his signature. We want the death of an entire people group. That's chaos. And then you can take all their stuff. That'll make it okay. Chaos. In the middle of that chaos, 
Here's our God of order leading and directing Esther at this point. And so if you had a chaotic week this past week, I want you to know that in the middle of that chaos, God has a plan. And he is at work to this very moment. I love that Esther is waiting three days, foreshadowing of what Christ would do. She would leave her palace where she had been placed. You stay here in the harem, in the women's quarters. You stay there, Esther. That's where you are to stay. She left her quarters, and she came out to mediate on behalf of her people before the, the all-powerful king of the day. Think about this. Jesus was placed in the grave, and really, death says, you stay there. The guards posted outside, you stay there. The stone rolled in front of the, of the tomb, you stay there. But after three days, Jesus said, I will stay here no longer. I will stay here no longer. Death cannot hold me. Death cannot keep me in. He would leave the grave and he would come to serve as our perfect mediator, the mediator who could serve between a holy God and sinful man. And he would say, I have come so that sinful man can be brought back into a relationship with a holy God. I have come just as Esther appeared before the king and mediated on behalf of her people. I have come to mediate on behalf of sinful people bringing a holy God and sinful people back together again. There is such beauty in this, and if we will be teachable and see it, there is so much for us to understand in the book of Esther. Once again, we see that Esther is not the hero of the story, yet Jesus is the hero of the story. He is the hero of every story, and he longs to be the hero of your story, and my story, our story. As we open our Bibles, we see who He is and what He's done. And then we learn how to live. Here's what we learn about Esther a little bit right here. When Esther says she will do something, she does it. I love that about her. I hope that's said of you. When you say you will do something, you do it. When you say you will complete a job, you get it completed. When you say you'll show up on time, you show up on time. When you say you will do something, you do it. Esther said, fast for three days, and on the third day, I'll go before the king. And what we have here is the account of her coming before the king. After three days, she left the harem. She left her place where she was told, this is where you can go in the palace complex. And she left that and went before the king, knowing full well she was breaking the law, and she was entering into a place where her life could be taken. She put on her royal robes. She left her chambers. She headed toward his quarters. And now, this is a good spot for us to stop and say, is this fairy tale land with palaces and princesses and queens and kings, and, uh, is that real? This past week, I just jumped off uh, the internet, and went to Google, and I just typed in Ahasuerus Palace. You can type in there Xerxes Palace. And to see if it's real, let's show you a few uh, photos of the palace where she lived. This is modern-day Iran. If you try to go there today, you could be arrested without being there uh, and be sent to prison. It's not necessarily an open and free land. But this is the palace complex. This is where she would have lived. In fact, if you look at it with the, the ridges in the background, it doesn't look so different than Yakima. I love that parts of the world, we relate to it more than other places because we said we get the terrain. We get it. We understand it. And uh, this is part of that palace complex, and it's multi-layered, and there are different spots. In fact, there's a spot here that has now a covering on it. That was the harem quarters. They're using it as a museum and a place to uh, deal with all the things that they're discovering in this place. In the harem quarters where all the women would have been kept, including where Queen Esther would have been a part of this. Let's go to the next slide there and show this next one. I love this picture. It's part of that beautiful architecture that's everywhere there. You see the lion biting into the gazelle. That is to tell you that the Persian Empire will come and devour all its enemies. And there will be no one who stands against us. The lion of Persia. 
You're like, what about the lion of Judah? That's not the lion of Judah. That's the lion of Persia, the king. Let's go to the next slide there. This is uh, one of the great things. And you, uh, it's difficult to see, but you can see the, the beautiful inscription of people in very visual manner, but also recorded there is actually etched into the rock their history. This is the palace of Xerxes. Ahasuerus, as our Bible tells us, this is a real place, a real king with real people and real history that God used in a real way. You can go there and you can see the, the history etched into the walls. One more that we would show you. This is uh, uh, multiple places there that you can see. This is actually uh, a picture of King Ahasuerus being attended by some of his slaves, some of his servants, one holding the umbrella over him to block the sun, another fanning him with a beautiful big feather so that the king could be comfortable at any time, no matter where he went. Real people in a real place. This is where we need to have God impact us in the real world, not in fantasy land. And this is the truth. You can dig and dig and dig, and the more you find, the Bible is authenticated in archaeology. Other religions certainly do not have that. They say, oh, this happened in this place. And you dig down there and you find nothing. You dig down there and find that didn't happen here. But more and more and more that is uncovered, you see it. This is a real historical record. We don't know the exact spot where Esther stood in that massive complex. We don't know where she got into the sight line of the king. And that's probably good. Have you noticed this? When people discover things like that, oh, come and stand here in the Esther spot. Come stand right here and kind of channel the inner Esther. That's not good. I'm glad we don't know exactly where she stood, even as we look at this description. All we know is from his throne, she came into his sight line. He could see her. And because he saw her, it is now the opportunity either for life or death. Life or death. This means she placed herself in harm's way. She was sacrificial. She is teachable. She's courageous. She's humble. She's sacrificial. She's wise. In fact, that brings us to the first point of two points today. Hold on to this. God wants you to be a difference maker. And difference makers must be humble and wise. Humble and wise. Would they say that about you at a memorial service? That you were humble and wise? Would they say that about your last week? If they could not, I pray that God will help us to be humble and wise as we go forward because the Spirit of God helps us to be humble and wise. Watch the details that are given here in this historical account. The details are important. It shows somebody who's in step and living very thoughtfully, very intentionally by listening to the Spirit of God and preparing themselves well. She is thoughtful. She's not rash. She's someone who counts the cost. She didn't skip any steps along the way. She didn't cut any corners. <coughs> Lives are on the line. She knows it. And she is going to do her very best. Do you realize this? She doesn't carry the weight of the world. If I fail in this, everybody dies. She knows if she doesn't do anything, everybody dies. Some of us try to be the Savior, and it always backfires. Would you agree? You've tried to change somebody's heart. It doesn't work well. If you try to intervene and, and make somebody be different, it's not going to uh, happen for you because you're not the Savior. But you can be humble and wise. Look at how she did it. She did it simply in her, the choice of her clothing. It mentions her clothes here. She put on her royal robes. She put on her royal robes, her royal robes, tasteful, respectful, appropriate. Think about this. If you go to a job interview, but you decide, I'm not going to go ahead and comb my hair today. I'm not going to get out of my jammies. I'm not going to brush my teeth. I'm not going to prepare at all. I'm just going to go to the interview. Normally, unless you're working for some pajama factory, it's frowned upon. And they're going to say, you didn't take any time, you didn't prepare well, you didn't even treat us with enough respect to come in the right way, you don't get the job. She put on her royal robes. 
who knows what is on that. Maybe on the one side embroidered is that lion uh, biting into the gazelle. And she said, isn't that beautiful as he tears the leg off that gazelle? Isn't that a beautiful thing on my royal robes? On the other side might be a, a picture of, of the king himself and his regal stature. Maybe on the throne. Maybe on the back it just says something like this. Ahasuerus is my king. On the back of all kinds of jerseys, we have all kinds of names and different things like that. She comes in her royal robe. She has come. She needs business, and she has prepared herself. We know this about her countenance. She doesn't appear flustered. She didn't run in there red-faced and sweaty and say, What's going on about this edict? And I can't believe you would have that happen. Who do you think you are, the king? To which the king would say, Yeah, and you're gone. She doesn't come in sad. You're not to be in the, uh, the presence of the king in a sad way. She's not coming in a way that is despairing. She's not in despair. She came in in confidence. She came before him. Her clothes, her countenance, her conduct. Notice this, that she came into the outer court and she waited. I don't know about you, but waiting is hard. Waiting is hard. And she waited to be summoned. And when she was summoned, she came uh, before him. And she did as everyone who was summoned. She came and gave the right protocol. That means she probably bowed, touched the staff, and then waited to be, to be spoken to so she could speak then. Notice that she has an attention to detail all along the way. She is humble. She is wise. She is a, a great example of somebody who is not living one-dimensionally. I want to give you a warning today. This is not normal that we issue a warning like this, but I, I think there are two ways to live for the Christian. There are two ways to live. I can live as a spirit-filled Christian who is humble and wise, or I can live as a Christian who just lives like everyone else and follows the urges and, and the thoughts of my flesh. Living this way, according to my flesh, leads me to one-dimensional decision-making, one-dimensional living, and, and, and how I go about life. Over here, I see a spirit-filled person saying, you want to know what wisdom looks like? It looks like this. Let's talk about one-dimensional. Here's the warning. Don't, don't live this way. Be careful of one-dimensional decisions. One-dimensional decisions can be living on my emotions. I can live on my emotions, and we think, oh, isn't that passionate? Oh, isn't that, that wonderful? Oh, look at, look at how, how courageous and how uh, they really believe that. Emotional decision-making is rash and irrational. I run in, I, I run ahead of God, I, I say whatever comes to my mind, I, I make decisions hastily, I do things that are foolish, I do things that I regret because I lived on my emotion. In a therapy world, they say your brain is divided into the emotional center and the logic center. And they would describe in a therapy way of when you bring emotion and logic together as wisdom. In a spiritual sense, we say it this way, that when I use my head and my heart in tune with the Spirit, then I am living in a way that honors God. Emotional decisions are one way to do things. Logical decisions, that's another way to live one-dimensionally. That is just cold and calculated. And, and so withdrawn, unempathetic of what's going on in other people's lives. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. This is what makes sense. It doesn't matter. This is going to happen. There. But did you ever? I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking logically, like Spock off of Star Trek. I'm just going to make every decision logically. I'm not going to think about people. That's not your only option. If I live uh, as a spirit-filled Christian, not just according to my flesh, one dimension, if I live according to the Spirit of God, He will help me. He will help you. Be prayerful, thoughtful, and timely in making decisions. Notice that she didn't run in there 
she waited three days before she approached him. During that time, she is praying. Other people are praying. They're fasting. They're giving up food so they can be focused on what she should say, how she should approach him, what she shouldn't say. Uh, Lord, help me. I'm scared. I don't want to come in there in, a, in an emotional way. I don't want to come in there just in a stoic way. If you do this, you're a bad king. Be careful. Be careful of one-dimensional decision-making. Be careful of living in one-dimensional. When God created you, that you, through the Spirit of God, would you use both parts of your brain, would use your head and your heart together because the Spirit of God overcame your natural tendencies. Be careful of one-dimensional decisions. Live in a way that is humble and wise. When you group them together, we call that wisdom. Head and heart. Head and heart working together. Wisdom. Front part of your brain to the back part of your brain. Emotions and logic working together. Wisdom. The queen invites the king. Look at this beautiful plan. Very, very thoughtful. The queen invites the king and Haman to come to a feast that day. That means she already has made preparations. They are already cooking the meat. They are already uh, uh, getting the wine ready. They, they have called all the funeral homes and they've all brought their bottles of wine for the king. They have it ready for the king. The table has been set. Hey, I'd like you to come today to a feast. You don't just throw a feast together. Come together for a feast. By the way, does she know these guys? Do they like a good party? Yes or no? Yeah. Do they like good food? Yes. Yeah. Do they like good wine? Does the king like good wine? Yeah. Yes, especially from the funeral. He loves it. <laughs> yes, good food, wine, something that speaks to the king. She is very humble and wise about how she is going about these decisions. The king says this, come on, I know you have a request. Go ahead and tell me what, what you don't. You don't have to go through all of this. Just tell me what's on your heart. I appreciate that about the king, but she knows this. It's okay to be slower in your decision making. Slow down and not be hasty. Wait. Wait until you're summoned. Wait until he asks you to tell him. Wait for the right moment. Wait. This is what he said, go ahead and ask me, and I'll give you, hyperbole here, I will give you even up to half of my kingdom, I'll give it to you. He doesn't really mean that. It's a way of speaking that says, I'm, I'm ready to help you, I'm ready to jump in. And I was thinking about, where else did I see this in the Bible, where this happened, where a king spoke in this way, and then he got caught because it was an emotional decision, and it cost someone deeply, and it took me to the New Testament where King Herod had his stepdaughter provocatively dancing for him and for all of these guests that he had. And he said to her, Hey, ask me for anything, even up to half of my kingdom, and I'll give it to you. And she went to her mom and said, What should I ask for? And her mom said, Ask for the head of John the Baptist. That's emotional decision making. That's foolish decision making. That's living in an unwise manner. And it cost others. It cost John his very life. Here's what she says. I want you, you can almost see maybe a stutter right here. I, I want you to come back tomorrow to another feast and then I'll tell you. I want you to come and we'll have great food again. We'll have great wine again. And everything will be just right, just like you like it. And come back tomorrow. I read multiple commentaries on this to say, what was going on here? And here's the consensus. Nobody can really say unless the scripture tells us exactly. But either, either she lost courage at this point, which could have happened. Or she just sensed and knew the timing wasn't right. To bring her petition before the king. Whatever the case may be, whether she lost her nerve or she just knew it wasn't right, what we are witnessing here 
is the beauty of Queen Esther on display, and it has nothing to do with her royal robes, it has nothing to do with her makeup that day, it has nothing to do with her hairstyle or how the crown sat on her head. What we see is the beauty of her character shining through, that she is teachable, that she is humble, that she is courageous, that she's sacrificial, that she's wise, and everybody knows it, including the king, and that is attractive. Same character as what the world says. That's what I've been missing. That's what I've been missing. I see a lot of people living lots of different ways, but I don't see many people living in a teachable, humble, courageous, sacrificial, and wise way. But you are. How are you doing that? For us, for us, it would be only, only through the Spirit of God. Because I know me, and you know you. As we look at this, we say, Lord, give us that kind of character. Teachable, humble, courageous, sacrificial, and wise. In fact, I don't think we should go any further in this, in this morning without asking the Lord to help us in that way. Would you just stop right now and we, let's, let's ask the Lord to give us that wisdom we're living this way. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you and we see the beauty of your hand moving in the life of Esther. We know that the spirit of the living God who was moving and instructing and teaching Esther, that spirit is available to every Christian. Holy Spirit, come and fill every person here to overflowing. Help us to be people who are teachable. Help us to be people who are humble. Help us to be people who are courageous. Help us to be people who are sacrificial. Help us to be wise, not in our own eyes, but in the eyes of the King of Heaven. Help us because we can't do it without you. We can't make this happen. We need you to cause it to happen in us and through us. And Jesus, we invite you to do that so that that these words would be more than just words. They would be the truth spoken about our lives. That the living God got a hold of us in such a powerful way that we have been changed. Do that, Jesus. We beg you. We pray. Amen. Now I need to tell you that the, the title of the message, as we said at the beginning, was Humility versus Pride. I'm going to show you the comparison contrast. You're seeing God work powerfully in the life of Esther. Somebody who is in step with the Spirit of God. Now I need to show you the opposite of what it looks like just to live out of your flesh and live for yourself and to, to conduct your life with you at the center of your universe. Esther chapter 5, verse 9 to 14, it says this. And Haman, that prime minister went out, went out from the party, the first party she threw. He left the party that day joyful and glad of heart. Man, he had some good food. Man, he had some great wine, even though it was from the funeral home. He loved it. He had some great company, the king and the queen and just him. Nobody else gets to do that. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he neither rose nor trembled before him. He was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons. You can see that he had ten sons later in the book. We'll see that. All the promotions promotions with which the king had honored him and how he had advanced him above all the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, even the queen, Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Now watch verse 13. Yet all this is worth nothing to me. 
so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. You see him spitting and fuming. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows, fifty cubits at seventy-five feet, high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Watch what it looks like to be anything but humble and wise. See the harsh and stark contrast between Queen Esther, a woman who is in step with the Spirit of God, and Haman, a man who is in step with himself and his wicked advisors. That brings us to the second point today. Difference makers, and that's what God is calling us to be, must reject, we must reject it, pride and idolatry, the worship of false things, including ourselves. If you look at verse 9, it is a troubling verse. It is actually a very schizophrenic verse. It is a, a verse that, that shows the difficulty in the soul, the real difficulty in the soul of Haman. He leads the feast. He's walking on sunshine. He, he's, he's two feet off the ground. He has got the world by the tail, and he is so happy until what happens in his sight line is Mordecai. Watch how this happens. This is showing the comparison contrast. When Esther walked into the court and got in the sight line of the king, he was joyful. And he summoned her. And he wanted to see her. And it's a good day when she got in his sight line. But when Mordecai is in the sight line of Haman, Haman hates him. And all of that joy, all of that gladness of heart, it's all gone in an instant. Because Mordecai still won't bow. And he still won't tremble before him. And he is filled with wrath. Said he was joyful and glad of heart. It could have been the wine. But he left puffed up with pride and self worship. And then, when he would not be worshipped by Mordecai, all of that disappeared in an instant. Haman's joy is gone. He is filled with rage. And I, I just, this is a show of hands now, and it's not a great thing. It's not a glorious thing. How many of you have had a great day only to have something seemingly insignificant ruin it? Come on. Come on. You got home, and you're like, it's been a great day. I'm going to have that last piece of cake. I'm going to have it. And somebody in your house ate it. And your day was ruined. Now you're just so upset. It's not even, my life is not even worth living. <laughs> Go buy some more cake. Listen, we are so much like Haman. It's, it, 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 it unnerves us. We say, I want to be more like Esther. Amen. That's good. Let's be more like Esther because Esther is, is resembling Jesus. But the truth is, we are so much like Haman. Prideful. Idolaters where we worship all kinds of false things that make us feel good or look good. If your joy can be wiped away that easily like Haman's, then it wasn't joy to begin with. It was the wine. Or a false sense of happiness that gets knocked down and you say, that wasn't joy if it could be removed that easily. What does he do? I think it's interesting. He summons his friends. He wants people around him who think he's great and who love him and, and tell him he's awesome. He summons his wife, Zeresh, and then he doesn't listen to them. He goes into a monologue of about how great he is, how much money he has. How powerful he is. How he has ten sons. How he has been so, so healthy and vibrant. Look at all my sons. Look at this. And then, I, oh, look at all the awards and the achievements I've done. Watch him go ribbon by ribbon, trophy by trophy, medal by medal. And he is, what is he doing? He is trying to build his self-worth. Back up. Because he was so fragile. All of his value is external. All of his value is based on the words of others. And when Mordecai won't bow, and when Mordecai won't tremble, even after the edict is given, when he won't do this, 
It is destructive to his entire person. He says this again in verse 13. Yet all of this, everything I've achieved, everything I've done, all of it is worth nothing. So long as Mordecai, the Jew, is sitting at the king's gate. My life is worth less because he is living. I'm going to tell you this. This is a hatred that is satanic at the core. And if you recognize this in your own life, it is the time to repent of it. And it is time to turn from it. It is time to say, Jesus, that doesn't belong in my life. In fact, I just want to give you a little axiom here that would hold true to all of us. Be careful of listening too much to praise or to criticism. Be careful if you're living on the praise of others or if you're living on the criticism of others. If you listen to too much of either of those, you are an unhealthy person according to the world standards and definitely by the standards of the Savior who says this. It's not the externals that make you. It's not your achievement. It's not your clothing. It's not your hairstyle. It's not what car you drive. It's not the home you live in. It's not the neighborhood you belong to. It's not your achievements that give you worth. Jesus said He created you. He loves you. He came into the world for you. He died for you. He went to the grave for you. He rose again so you could have life. And He says this about you when you are deemed worthless. He said, I say difference. You are worth dying for. You're worth living for. I wish I could go into every every therapeutic session where somebody is searching for their worth and say to them, do you know what Jesus says about you? Do you know what Jesus says about you? Because when you do, you will stop listening to all the praise and all the criticism. And you will listen to the Spirit of God who says, you're worth it. And I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Watch what happens for Haman, who is not in step with the Spirit of God. He's in step with spirits, by the way. He's in step with spirits. The spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the evil prince and power of this world. He's in step with the spirits, but not the Spirit of God. Watch what his wicked wife and his wicked friends or wicked counselors giving him all kinds of bad advice. This is what they say. You know what? You need to feel powerful. You need to feel strong. You need to feel good about yourself. You need to be ready to go back, back to that feast in a good mood. And here's what you should do. Go set up a gallows that's almost eight stories tall. It'll be above every tree. That'll be above all the walls and the buildings around it. In fact, you some have said that they even took this and they put it on top of a building so that they could reach that height. Not like they had 75 foot posts just hanging around. See, what a gallows, I'm picturing hangman, I'm picturing the noose, I'm picturing that. That's kind of Wild West America. This is Persia, and what they do is they sharpen the end of a post, and they hang you on it. He wanted everyone to see how powerful he was. He wanted everyone to know that he was great. Because that's where his self-worth was found. That's where his idolatry dug in deep, is that he lived on the praise of people. And so this wicked counsel makes sense to him. Do this. Make a statement. Pride and idolatry are sick partners. They will tell you anything that you want to hear in order to stay in power or feeling good about you. The truth is, if you're a Christian today, if you know Jesus Christ, pride and idolatry have to die in the heart of every follower of Jesus. Pride and idolatry have no place in our lives. 
humility, wisdom have all kinds of room. So I need to grow in that. You will grow in that as you reject pride and idolatry. And I want you to see something here. In the middle of this plot to take out Mordecai, this plot would be accomplished. But it would be accomplished years later when Jesus himself, who came into our world, into the darkness, they would hang him on a tree. They would put him on a post. We call it crucifixion. He would be put there. He would be lifted up for everyone to see. He was made an example of by the powers of his day. The sign above his head told him, uh, told everyone around that you don't mess with the powers that be. You leave it alone or you'll end up like Jesus, King of the Jews. It was satire. So what does this have to do with my life? What, what, what does this have to do with me today? What does it have to do with my week that I'm about to face this is what it has to do with your life and my life. Jesus this morning would invite us to reject the pride and idolatry that we get so easily consumed with. That we would come to Him, that we would humble ourselves, that we would confess our sin, we would recognize our need for a Savior, Jesus, that we can't be all that we want to be. We can't do it in ourselves, and the counsel of heaven, not the counsel of wicked friends, would be this. Come and humble yourself. Come and confess your sins. Because Jesus, the humble King of heaven, gave His life for you. He was hung on a tree. The cross. He was teachable. He was humble. He was courageous. He was sacrificial. And He was wise. <coughs> when we were unwise. <coughs> we will surrender to the King. He will give us salvation. He'll give us life. He'll give us wisdom. He'll give us humility. He'll help us to be teachable. He'll help us to model Him and be sacrificial. He'll help us to be courageous. All of those things will be said of you because of Him. Please don't do this on your own. Listen, if you don't know Jesus this morning, I urge you to come to Him and say, Jesus, in humility, you come to Him and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I need you to change me. Jesus, I want to follow you. That means he's the leader and you're not. Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus. And Jesus, we are so grateful for your sacrifice. We're so grateful for what you did on the behalf of sinful men and women. Across the ages, Jesus, you came in and you knew what to do. Lord, help us to lay down our pride and our our idolatry. Lord, where we've stepped in it this past week, wash our feet, we pray. And as we leave this place, I pray that we would resemble you because we remembered you accurately. All praise to the name of the Savior Jesus.